Kirby's Dream Land. Why am I talking about this game after an epic trilogy of Sonic videos? Well, I can't continue the contemporary Sonic conversation for very much longer since the series has been dry on news for a good while, and it doesn't seem like that's going to change in the near future. It would be wise to take a break and refresh, and what could be more laid back and refreshing than the first game in the Kirby series? After all, HAL Laboratory and Masahiro Sakurai of Super Smash Bros. fame developed this early 90s platform game with the intent of it being something that anyone could enjoy, even those unskilled at action games. Not a bad idea, considering how tough many platformers of the same vintage can be, but what exactly does Kirby Dream Land have to offer besides its accessibility? Kirby's Dream Land structurally is your typical 2D platformer. The stages are all point A to point B endeavors, with walking, jumping, and beating enemies and bosses in between. Already knew all that? Good. In terms of base handling, Kirby moves and jumps about as well as you could ask him to, with responsive inputs and decent speed and weight. I personally would have liked it if turning around was a bit faster, but that's just my preference and the only real issue I have with the regular controls. Mechanically, Kirby's Dream Land doesn't have that many differences from other platformers from the same era, but the differences it does have are fairly major. The most subtle is how Kirby dives after falling for a certain amount of time, allowing him to kill enemies that are directly below him. It's quite convenient, for the most part, but I'll get back to that. By pressing up, Kirby can float through the air, making basic work out of most platforming. It does seem to be slower than walking and jumping though, so it does have a sense of give and take. Kirby also attacks by inhaling and spinning out enemies, but this can't be done while floating, since he has to inhale air to float. These touches give a semblance of balance to what would, in any other game, be overpowered abilities. So, how well does the level design accommodate these overpowered abilities? Well, in the game's normal mode, nothing about the level design is particularly difficult, but as I stated in the intro, that was part of this game's greater intent. As for how memorable the experience is, there really isn't a whole lot about the levels that sticks out in that regard either. Green Greens does at least do a good job teaching the mechanics, without the need for any sort of text-based tutorials. I can recall one plateau that requires you to use the float ability, for example. Uh, but it's mostly a simple left-to-right affair with some small ledges, a few enemies, and a place to refill your HP. The most memorable part is a vertical section where you float up the inside of a tree. Yay. Castle Lilolo does stick out a bit more with its emphasis on alternate routes and exploration, though the execution is a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes the Sage does this idea well with different areas you only get to see with multiple playthroughs, sometimes, however, the doors just lead to dead ends with only an easy to defeat enemy occupying the space. <sighs> Fortunately, while the game as a whole is easy by default, it does successfully scale up the difficulty with each passing level. Float Islands makes things a bit tougher with enemies that are more aggressive and difficult to inhale, and some that turn invisible. It also has a cave section that's reminiscent of Castle Lolo, with a few optional secrets to find. Bubbly Clouds has more bottomless pits, greater emphasis on the float ability, and the scarfy enemies that are immune to being inhaled, and will rush to attack you if you try. The enemy variety throughout the game is overall pretty solid, and each of the four levels progressively introduces us to some new faces with their own patterns and behaviors. In addition to what I've already mentioned, there are masks that home in on you, ghosts that bounce around, waddle dees and doos that sometimes have parasols, and cannons and gordos that can't be inhaled or destroyed by any means that I know of. It does somewhat make up for the lack of interesting set pieces in the levels. Another thing that helps improve the variety is the game's presentation. Visually speaking, Kirby's Dream Land is a nice looking title for Game Boy standards. Character sprites are neither too small nor too big, and the environments look distinct and detailed but not too cluttered, with the backgrounds often changing as you progress through level. Castle Lolo has several different wallpapers, Float Islands has a pirate ship section, and Bubbly Clouds goes from clouds to ruins to a starry sky. Maybe the cave area of Float Islands could have looked a little less sparsely decorated, but there's really not too much that I can complain about. There are also these adorable cutscenes that play before each level begins where Kirby is doing something in the environment, like getting her harassed by butterflies in green greens, or sneezing off the stars of Castle Lolo. Those are also a nice added touch. The soundtrack is also very solid. Each of the four levels has its own theme, and each is catchy in its own way. Green Greens is the most famous of the bunch with its recognizable, upbeat and catchy melody. The rest of the soundtrack is just as high energy while still fitting the levels. Those dyads in Castle Lolo are some good stuff and give the track a slight tinge of a haunted place. Float 
Island sounds appropriate for a beach setting in a way I can't describe. Maybe it's because it's in the F major key. And the high pitch of bubbly clouds is appropriate for, well, a high place in the sky. I know, I sounded like a huge music nerd there. Shush. Now back to the gameplay. Scattered throughout the game are traditional power-ups such as a lollipop that grants Kirby invincibility, super spicy curry that gives him fire breath, a microphone that clears the entire screen, and uh... I think that's supposed to be a mint leaf? I don't recall them looking so... spotted. That one causes Kirby to perpetually float and spit out air as projectiles. Since they're so sparsely placed, easy to grab, and temporary, these feel pretty situational, and while they don't detract from the game, they don't add a whole lot either. The 1-ups and health drops, Cola that recovers 2 hit points and Maxim Tomatoes that recover all HP, occasionally found throughout the game are more useful. Grabbing them can sometimes involve a mini challenge, such as having to get past an enemy or two, but other times they're not hard to get at all. There are also five main boss fights, one for each level, and beating each one rewards you with one of the plot MacGuffins, the Sparkling Stars. Wispy Woods is pretty lame since spinning his apples back isn't much of a challenge, and his only other attack is blowing wind at you. The other bosses are fortunately more interesting. They're not super hard, but there is a bit of variety to these guys. Lolo and La 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 push boxes through narrow corridors, and inhaling and spitting back the boxes while still avoiding the boss can be tricky. The fight against Kabula uses the mint leaf thing I mentioned earlier. This turns the boss into a kind of shoot 'em up where you have to damage the boss with air shots while avoiding the boss's bullets and its well telegraphed charge move. Krako must be defeated by spitting back the waddle doos he spawns and they can fire beams just like Krako can. His charge move is pretty unpredictable, which I find a bit weird coming after Kabula, but that's the biggest problem with the fight. These bosses can also be figured out rather quickly since there are also mid bosses in each level, aside from float islands, that are intended to introduce the player to the boss con before they have to fight the real boss, another instance of teaching the player without resorting to tutorials. And yes, Poppy Bros Sr. is just as underwhelming as Wispy Woods. Before we face off against King DDD though, we have to fight unchanged versions of all these bosses again in order to artificially extend this game's already short length. To be fair though, the boss refights are all preceded by brief level sections that are different from the main levels, but still. Anyways, after clearing that roadblock, it's time to voice our complaints to the upper management. King DDD is the game's toughest boss with perhaps the widest variety of attacks. He will try to whack you with a cartoony wooden mallet, dive into you, stomp you, and inhale you. To beat him, Kirby must inhale the star-shaped shockwaves that come from his stomp and hammer attacks and... Well, use what you've learned, champ. After putting that penguin out of commission, Kirby floats the castle away and returns all the stolen food to Dreamland. Uh, man, what is it with these old platformers and showing us the story at the end but not the beginning? I made it no secret that I thought the normal mode was noticeably easy, and that fact would likely make this game less appealing to those who like a good challenge in their platformers. Since this is meant to be a game for everybody, how do you appeal to those people? That's where the extra mode comes in. After beating normal mode, you get a code that you can input on the title screen in order to play the game's extra, extra mode. mode. The main difference here is that the game is now considerably harder. I didn't get a single game over on this game's normal mode, yet the extra mode gave me several. Many enemies have been replaced with variants that are more aggressive, further improving the already good enemy variety. Some more enemies have been placed, and the bosses have tougher patterns. Wispy Woods is honestly a lot more fun to fight this way since he now drops Gordos in addition to apples, and Lolo and La 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 being much faster had me getting pretty creative. King DDD is also a lot faster and took me quite a few tries. All this makes extra mode fairly engaging and adds replay value to a game that definitely otherwise needs it. Not everything about the extra mode knocks it out of the park though. While not that common, the object placement and movement can feel unfair on the occasion. There were a few times that I got hit by an enemy that I couldn't possibly have had the time to react to. 
Kabula turned into a boss that is now way too hard to avoid damage from since she moves and shoots very erratically, and I found myself trying to brute force the boss while sometimes miraculously avoiding the attacks. Krako Jr. at least has a memorizable pattern, but I could swear that the mechanic where Kirby dives after falling for a little bit messes up the controls in some way or another, since I often failed to inhale the bombs when I wanted to. These issues legitimately make him harder than the regular Krako in extra mode for Pete's sake. It's worth noting that the game does have unlimited continues, with getting a game over starting you at the beginning of the level, so these moments, while bothersome, don't kill the experience. At the same time, extra mode leaves some issues untouched. It doesn't make the levels any more distinct from one another than the normal mode did, and the power-ups are implemented the exact same way as before. If you can get by these issues and make it to the end of the game on extra mode, the game will give you the code for config mode, where you can adjust Kirby's HP meter and lives counter in case you wanted the game to be even harder. All things considered, I'd say HAL Laboratory succeeded in making a game that everyone could enjoy with Kirby's Dream Land. They got the basic sound with solid controls, wide enemy variety, and pleasing presentation. The normal mode can satisfy those inexperienced in the realm of platformers with its easy difficulty while not feeling too handholdy, and those more experienced have the extra mode and config mode to make the experience more challenging. However, I can't say that this is a game that will rock everyone's world. The levels don't have very many standoff moments, the power-ups don't add much to the design, and the game is very short with the extra and config modes being the only thing that add replay value as opposed to anything baked into the core design. Even then, there are a few questionable moments in extra mode that made it a bit annoying on my first try. I can't be too harsh on Kirby's Dream Land, though. It really wouldn't be fair to expect much groundbreaking stuff from this, considering it was the first game in the Kirby series. And when it comes to video games, sequels are usually known to try and improve on what worked and add more to the foundation laid down by the first game. Obviously, Kirby's Dream Land was successful enough to spawn a long-running series and sequels that could improve on what this first century set in place. Will the first of these Kirby's Adventure have more substance and therefore more for me to talk about? Tune in whenever I decide to upload again to find out. King DDD is the game's toughest boss with perhaps the widest variety of attacks. 